Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, the Praise of Folly podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Don't forget to follow me on Telegram, Facebook, and Locals. And you can support me on Subscribestar, Locals, and buy me a coffee. And you can also contact me with my email address, which is also in the description box. Now, today's episode was based on a request. So uh, let me back it up. A few a couple weeks ago on my YouTube community, I commented and said, were there any recommendations from the people that watch my show? You know, topics they'd like to see me do, things they'd like to change up. Mostly everybody was happy with what they saw, but there were a few recommendations. And one of them was from Cyber Ninja Zero over two videos done by on Radlib's channel, Radical Liberation, with Black Horse. One was the gas war, February the 1st, 2024. And the second one was the scarcity delusion, February the 15th, 2024. So this is little over a month later from the last one. But I felt like that since my channel is known for being very collapsitarian, not just for their limits of energy consumption, but for other reasons as well. I thought, yeah, this is definitely in the sphere. This is something that people have questions about, especially if they watch a lot of my stuff. So what did I think about, about this? So before I give uh, a full uh, thought on that, I'll go through some of the points. Now, the first, uh, and then do a point by uh, point counterpoint discussion, and then sort of step back and look at a bigger picture. The first thing is the gas war wasn't directly relevant to a lot of the stuff that I say, so I didn't spend as much time taking notes on it. There's much more relevant in the scarcity delusion, but I will go in chronological order. So in uh, at around the 19 minute and 15 second mark on the gas war, Black Horse uh, casually states that the tar sands of Canada, it's about $50 a gallon to get out. Whereas for Gulf oil, so presumably not just Saudi Arabia, but also like, you know, Qatar, uh, would be $1.50 a gallon. Now, this is what's interesting, right? And we'll, I won't spend too much time on this here because this is going to be more, the methodology behind these statements is going to be more fleshed out in their, their work on the scarcity delusion. But why is it that tar sands is $50 a gallon and Gulf oil is $1.50? Because tar sands are hard to get at. You have to squeeze the oil out, which means it has a very low EROI return. So my argument is, yeah, of course, tar sands is going to be really, really expensive. It's not a very efficient way to get oil. And by efficient, and I'll get to this later on, I don't mean financially efficient, but that might be the case too. I mean energy efficient. All right. Uh, one of the things that's repeated throughout, so I'll just mention in the beginning, whether it's something like natural gas or oil or coal or rare earth materials, Black Horse is going to say this is these are purely politically motivated shortages. So that's the go-to response. So just keep that in mind as we go through the list. At the 37, 38 minute mark, Black Horse says that the there's plenty of natural gas in Europe. It's for political reasons. It's not being developed. Now, this is very this is very strange, right? And, we'll, and we'll, we'll see more of this throughout. For anybody who's been around the libertarianism as long as I have, and certainly as long as Radlib has had, because he's a deal older than me, the argument that the libertarians always made was this little thing called comparative advantage. You Sure, you could grow oranges in a greenhouse in Canada, but it wouldn't be as effective as growing them in California. Sure, you could, I don't know, create some sort of simulated Canadian environment to grow maple trees in California, but it wouldn't be as efficient as having it produced in Canada. So the idea was, well, these protectionist chuds just don't understand comparative advantage. We need to import, you know, where people do what they do best. Well, yeah, of course, and natural gas is in Russia and United States and oils in the Middle East, this is just a free market comparative advantage. Uh, that's that's what the libertarians would have said at any point before now. And whenever anything like this came up, and I've been involved since 2001, that was their answer. So what changed? I mean, obviously it was more efficient to import uh, oil and natural gas from Russia. There was no need to develop uh, European reserves. It, everything was fine until... I guess you could say war, and or, or at least a new Cold War, so I guess that would support a Black Horse's political argument. But this is basically autarky, and we'll see more of this. 
which is very strange because libertarianism, again, was strongly opposed to any concept of autarky. At the 47-minute mark, Black Horse says that natural gas scarcity is a government policy and not a resource shortfall. Now, I know tar sands is oil, not natural gas. But why is it $50 a barrel and Saudi oil is $150? Yeah, they both have governments, sure. But the ultimate reason is tar sands are a lot harder to get out. That's why they're more expensive. Uh, okay, more of this. Scarcity is political, not natural. I, I mean, the, but prior to the Industrial Revolution, in some sense, scarcity was the norm. Now, the question is, has the Industrial Revolution fundamentally altered reality and that we can just kind of, you know, let things go on autopilot and not have to deal with scarcity? Well, that is the question, and I'll get into that later. But I think it's a little too early and a little glib to assume that we've we've beaten that dragon. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, also, Eroy isn't brought up in, in the uh, Gas Wars episode. So, again, that's disappointing because that's really where all this hinges upon. The other problem is when we talk about proven reserves... Program, I mean, in one sense, it's there, right? Yeah, but how can you get to it? Right? We weren't doing tar sands in the 90s. We didn't need to. They knew the tar sands were there, but there was no need to do it. There was a plenty of cheap oil and natural gas elsewhere. And, and you get it from elsewhere because that's just, according to libertarianism, that's just the market incentive. Just go to the Middle East, go to the United States, go to Russia. Now, the, the political impingements are not necessarily your own government, but other governments in this global chess game of geopolitics, which, yes, does directly affect all of this. And again, I would just say, again, the reason why the U.S. and Europe are struggling right now with a lot of these things is because of the free market orthodoxy. You, you know, if you can, someone else can do it cheaper, they do it. And we're going to have this whole world of interconnected supply chains, and there wasn't supposed to be a, a breakdown of this. Well, the breakdown has begun. And there was a whole lot of wars that weren't supposed to happen, but they've already begun. The Ukraine, uh, the Middle East with Gaza. Uh, there's, there's revolutions in West Africa. So these supply chains, and of course, most importantly, the Houthi rebels in Yemen disrupting su uh, the global supply chain up through the Suez Canal, forcing the shipping to reroute through the Horn of Africa which extends the journey of these container ships, which also increases the costs of insuring them and the commodity prices of the goods they deliver. The other reason why there's these, these resources aren't being directly developed in, say, Europe or America is nimbyism. A lot of people are like, not in my backyard. And, I mean, I don't think Radlib or Black Horse would want to live right next to a natural gas plant. So, I mean, we're all sort of guilty of nimbyism. It just is what it is. Unless you're too poor, and then you just have to deal with it. So this is going to be kind of quick. There wasn't a whole lot to say about uh, the gas war. It wasn't directly related to what uh, I've been saying. The main point here is now, now we get some of the under the hood discussion, right? So Radical Liberation talks about the ultimate resource, 1981 by Julian Lincoln Simon. Now, the, the takeaways for the purposes of the video are the only long-term trend up is the labor value. Um, probably tied to innovation because he talks about that a little bit later. And then he says commodity prices go down over on a long enough time frame and the price of people or human labor goes up. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I mean, this is totally contrary to what we see today. The only thing that won't go up is wages uh, in, in the modern economy with regards to prices. But we'll, we'll get a little bit into that a little bit later. Uh, and then, of course, the prices of material resources are in a long-term downward trend. Now, the, he says the working assumption they're going to use is the price of a commodity is our best guess as the supply of a commodity around the world. Now, I would argue this is a false assumption. So, for example, think diamonds. Diamonds are run by a cartel. So there's actually lots of diamonds, but in order to keep the prices artificially high, they limit how much diamonds are on the market. So you could actually have a high price for a commodity, but actually have a lot of it. Also, prices can be driven up by demand. So you could have a situation in which there's demand for a given commodity, so it's very, very high, uh, and it's common. 
And so that would then spur more efforts to acquire it. And then also the classic libertarian retort is, well, high prices are the result of inflation and inflation is the result of the government. So we have a lot of different factors which could lead to prices going up that have nothing to do with the, with the amount of resources. So how do we determine that? We're not told. So I don't, I don't know how you, one would go about determining that. Now, we move on to, uh, this is, uh, let's see. Oh, also, so oil and natural gas. The other thing is a lot of the, the so Ukraine right now, and also uh, Israel and Gaza, both uh, natural gas and oil, there were reserves in those areas that were known, but until technology developed around 2014, 2013, they couldn't really be developed. So nobody bothered, but now they can. And, and that was, yes, Russia gave many reasons why they invaded Ukraine, but of course resources are going to be a key part. Uh, the Black Sea coast has off sea natural gas. Uh, Eastern Ukraine, in addition to coal and grain, also has natural gas. And there's natural gas off the coast of Gaza. So whoever is fighting these wars seems to be very interested in getting these energy resources. Now, this could also be the result of the supply chain breaking down, which we've seen since COVID, and has been pushed into high gear again by the Houthis, and who knows what will happen next. But the question then is, you know, will this will this trend continue? I think it will. And I've said very on my channel in many different ways that I think it will. I don't need to go into all of that here. The other thing they point to is food prices. So they say, you know, fam is more or less ended in the 60s, except for communist political famines. Food costs are going down. Food is not scarce anymore. Famine avoided. Well, okay, two, there's a few problems here. First of all, modern agriculture is floating on a sea of hydrocarbons. So, yeah, I mean, you can make a lot of this stuff. But, uh, you know, this is the real linchpin. This is why this is why hydrocarbons is such a focus of catabolic collapse theory is if without that, this all falls apart. And furthermore, I'm not going to go into the whole seed oil side quest, <laughs> side track, but most of the food isn't food. So I, I don't care what line go up. That's not food. That's the other problem. But, you know, that's that's also outside the scope of this particular episode. If you want to know more about that, you should check out Rog Nationalist and his content. Now, this is really important here. And this was important for me, too, because I used to think just like this. So there was the famous bet between Simon and Paul Ehrlich from 1980 to 1999. And the bet was, uh, name any five, you know, Simon said to Ehrlich, name any five commodities you like. Are they going to go up or down in price over the next 10 years? So they picked chromium, copper, nickel, tin, and tungsten. And no surprise, they all went down. But you got to remember, this is the 80s. Like, the economy is great. It's great in the 90s. And it's even great under George W. Bush, at least until the 2007-2008 economic housing crisis. But this, this problem, and again, I used to think it was a convincing, but partly because this was the afterglow of the prosperity of America. But the time frame isn't long enough. And this is, this is really suspicious, right? First of all, I think the main mistake was Paul Ehrlich shouldn't have agreed to this bet 10 years is too short a time to look at these trends. Now, it's not easy to find a source that has like the long-term price trend per pound of all these commodities to the present day, but I did find one that goes from, that was goes up to 2010. And now let me share a screen here. Do, 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 do. We're going to do this. Okay, everybody. We have pri metal prices in the United States through 2010 by the U.S. Geological Survey National Minerals Information Center staff. So the first one we got here is copper. So on the y-axis, we have cents per pound. On the x-axis, we have year. And the blue line is the price. So if we look at this, what we see is that the price of copper skyrockets right up until 2010. Womp, womp. Okay, chromium. Same, same graph. The blue is the price. Skyrockets up to 2010. Womp, womp. Okay, now we have <coughs> nickel. <coughs> it skyrockets in 2005. It goes down, but then it starts climbing up again. And of course, 
Again, this only goes to 2010. Hold on a second. Okay, now we have... What is this here? Uh, tin. Okay, well, it starts climbing up at around 2000, and it's still climbing as of 2010. And we have uh, tungsten going up. All five of these commodities go up, but you wouldn't know that if you just look at 1980 to 1990. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Well, well, my friends, later on in this very episode, <laughs> at, I, I, I timestamped it at four. Uh, this is still the scarcity delusion. At 47.44, Radlib says that the bad guys cherry pick evidence by choosing a narrow time frame to show you. Hmm. 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 Like the 10-year window of these five commodities that skyrocketed after 2000? Very interesting. Very interesting. Why would someone do that? Okay, so we covered the bet. Let's go back. What do we got? More stuff to cover. Okay, now we'll talk about Paul Ehrlich and his, you know, fame as it didn't happen and all the other stuff. Sometime around 2020, I think it was right around COVID and the lockdowns, I, I started re-engaging with this with Paul or James Howard Kunstler and his three works on this broad theory. And he introduced me, of course, to John Michael Greer through that and uh, the other guy, I can't think of his name. But um, the first one was the long emergency, 2006, too much magic. I think it was 2008. And then 2020, a kind of like addendum to the long emergency. And the first two are more focused on the theory. The, the last book is a little bit of a mea culpa. Like he, he, he jumped the gun and picked a date that was too early that we passed. And he then tries to explain the shale boom. And then a lot of it's just personal testimony of friends, how they're trying to deal with the long emergency. So for our purposes, that's not really as important. Now, Yes, they have made a lot of predictions that just did not come true. It's true. It happened. But I had that, but if you ask yourself, look at all the predictions made by what what uh, Gems Kunster calls the corticopians, those who believe that we just keep on having all these technological advancements. Well, well, they're wrong most of the time, too, if not all the time. We still don't have HAL 9000, AI. We still don't have flying cars. We still don't have all the things they said we were going to have. Well, now I'm not going to hear to speculate on why, but them being wrong doesn't seem to hurt them at all. And then second of all, the the other issue that is brought up is the coal shortages. So I guess you could say peak coal, if you will. And Black Horse talks about a period from like 1870 to 1920. Well, a couple things here. One is, okay, it, let's say that I were to say, Within five years, if we don't put a levy, we're going to be flooded. And then 15 years out, somebody looks back and says, well, we didn't get flooded. Todd was wrong. But then that person fails to tell you that we built the levy. How seriously would you take that person? The coal shortage was avoided because we shifted to hydrocarbons. And so I think in many cases, these things were avoided because governments and individuals acted to head them off. So it's like, you know, you cry wolf and then you shoot the wolf and the wolf doesn't come. Well, someone listened. But but also we did jump to another commodity, oil. But there was a jump that hasn't happened yet. Nuclear. We were supposed to go from oil to nuclear. That didn't happen. And then, you know, there were people floated the idea of cold fusion. People floated the idea of green energy. There's only been three jumps in history. Wood to coal, coal to oil. Now, and for all of human history up to 1800, we just used wood. Why would you think we could keep jumping? That's not a given in human history. We might, but it doesn't look like that. In fact, it looks like <laughs> quite the opposite. And there were jumps that were supposed to happen that we were told were going to happen that didn't. Again, we, we're not here to speculate why, but they didn't. So, okay, there's that. Now, with regards to both uh, peak oil and uh, in the 70s and 80s, and then Pete Cole, Black Horse argues that these were responses to geopolitical pressures, that 
you know, in the, in, in the, the battleship age, if you didn't have coal, uh, you might lose a war because if you get blockaded and, and then your enemy prevents you from getting coal, you can't send your ships out. If the oil embargo from OPEC were to continue or be resumed, the U.S. would have trouble fighting the Soviet Union. Right. But all of this is a direct result of free trade and the anti-autarky arguments of libertarianism. And again, I had all sorts of arguments with libertarians about China, and they were wrong. China turned against the United States. It developed economically, as I predicted, and then it's now asserting its own will, as anybody could have seen. But on the Mises forums, I got no end to guff arguing that China would do this, and it has. And now everybody's forgotten about those arguments. And this is what makes these two videos very confusing to me. Um, on the one hand, the spirit is libertarian, right? It's a very libertarian spirit. Like we want to have this optimistic economic growth narrative, but it's very unlibertarian in delivery. The idea that um, autarky is actually really important and we need to be careful about what other nations might or might not do. You didn't talk like that as a libertarian 20 years ago, not even 10 years ago. So, and, and I'm sure there's probably a lot of libertarians today that wouldn't talk like that. So again, it's, it's a very confusing delivery. Now, I, I, again, as I said, there's an assumption here, and this is what Simmons assumption is, and appears to be the assumption of Radlib and Black Horse is that innovation, right? We could just innovate to new resources. So resources are quote, functionally limitless because we can just keep on innovating the new ones. Well, one, if that's possible, why didn't other empires do it like Babylon or Rome? And, and also we have in economics a principle called the law of diminishing returns that, you know, eventually if you keep doing something long enough, the yield that you get will go will be less and less and less. And in part, that's what the Eroi is. It's recognizing the law of diminishing returns. So human innovation, if, it's, if you're going to view it as an economic resource, it's not exempt from the law of diminishing returns. And we also need to make a distinction between an in theory potential innovation and an in practice reality. I mean, it might just be the case that for any number of reasons, uh, an ideal plan can't be executed. That's a that's a whole separate question. But again, I just don't believe this. This this just sounds well. This is the main thesis of Too Much Magic by James Howard Constor. It sounds like magic to me. How do we keep innovating ourselves out of this? Uh, next thing here, proven reserves. That's another thing that gets brought up a lot. The problem with proven reserves is that okay, we've known about a lot of this for a long time. It wasn't really viable to get at. One, because it was too expensive and we had enough cheap natural gas and oil elsewhere to not have to use these you know, edge, edge things like say fracking. But also they didn't have good energy returns. And so why would you do it? There's no need to. The fact that we are doing this indicates that it is harder to get. Now, the other thing is, given that we have a working theory here that as using Simmons' book, as Radlib says, if the prices of something goes up, it means it's getting more scarce. Okay, well, we're going to look at something here from Wall Street 24-7. This is 1990. Average gas price per gallon, $1.30. $1 three cents. Okay. No. We're going to go to today. Look. Okay. This goes over 2022. Well, look at this. 445 a gallon. It's tripled. More than tripled, actually. So gas prices go up. Does that mean we're running out of gas? No, no. It means we have inflation. It means we have the government mucking around. Well, now I don't know what it is. Is it is it the government, you know, mucking around with inflation and regulations, or is it a realistic appraisal of the limited uh, resource that we have? I mean, this is this is kind of what uh, Dave the Distributist calls a mod in Bailey. It's like, well, you know, I'll fight you in the moat, but then I'm going to jump into the castle and just hide behind the impenetrable walls of inflation. Okay, well, you know, not not a whole lot to be said on that. I don't really see how we can get very far with that. 
And and uh, okay, uh, they brought up again China on rare earths. Again, that's that's free market orthodoxy. That's libertarianism. I go back to my Mises arguments fifteen years ago. Yeah, it's just common sense. I mean, right? It's you know again going back to comparative advantage. China has a comparative advantage in rare earths, guys. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that's libertarian orthodoxy. I grew up with it. So so it's really kind of interesting how all of these policies which the libertarians cheered for for 20 years are now being blamed on the government. Hmm. Also interesting. And then let's see. Rylib says at 50, at the 5145 mark that drilling deeper is not an economic impossibility but a technical issue. Well, this is important, right? And, and I will frame this when we get to the next part. This is not primarily a price issue. This is a thermodynamic energy issue. And this fundamental misunderstanding of the concern and the problem is where a lot of this comes from. Because the, this, you know, even if they were going down, which they're not, those five commodities that were, were betted on were, were going up and oil is going up at the pump. The, the point is, that's still not really what we're talking about. This is just a, a reflection of that. It's it's the result of a sort of thermodynamic principle. And again, while Black Horse mentions catabolic collapse, he doesn't mention Eroy. So again, I can't really respond to that because he didn't really deal with the contention. Now, what is Eroy? Well, I'll just have a little video here, which I think will do quite a good job of explaining what Eroy is. All right, so I think that's a pretty good introduction, and that does come from the creator of, of the idea of Eroy's Hall, I think his name is. Let's see here. Uh, energy return. Eroy. Yeah. Yeah, Charles A.S. Hall. Okay, now we will be cycling energy for a while because that's what the entire system runs on, and it has to do that regardless. Now, this is not actually a valid measurement of collapse. Energy consumption is, right? So the last pillar to go will be this core hydrocarbon system on this theory. And what we will see, though, is a lot of the, the frills and luxuries go away. And we've all seen this, right? Life in 2005 was bizarre 
uh, people had more energy than they knew what to do with, both physically and also just to, to, to spend on stuff. That's all gone. The energy's gone. Just into the ether now. It's a lot. We're a lot poorer now than we were in 2005. Um, and so, yeah. And of course, the regime is going to put as much as it can into keeping this going because if that goes, everything goes, and that will be the last thing to go. It's this kind of thinking is mirrored in the left when, say, like the new atheists or the liberals thought that they could live in a very hedonistic way, right? They're going to fight reality. We're going to sleep with as many women as possible. We're going to get as stoned as possible. We're going to get as drunk as possible. We're going to do all of these self-destructive behaviors. And, hey, Mr. Christian, nothing bad happened to me yet. I'm still doing it. Must be wrong. Well, the entire system is built on sheltering you from the consequences of your bad decisions. So on that hand, for that reason, the idea being that, well, hey, look, you can't really do that. You know, well, we, we intuitively know they're wrong. So this is the same kind of thinking. It's thermodynamics, right? You go to one-to-one -one or below one-to-one -one and you become an energy sink, which means it's no longer a valid source of energy on a mass scale. And I look for shale oil, Eroys, and, you know, you get different figures. Uh, the highest I found is one to three and the lowest I found is one to 0.7. Needless to say, that's a lot worse than just the old oil fields we used to be drilling in the past. And, and this is, is not sustainable in the sense of thermodynamic efficiency. So what I would argue is that this just doesn't fly. Black Horse uh, sunset at 58, 39, 58, 44 mark that we have enough shale gas for 300 years at a very low cost. Citation needed, I have no idea. Certainly tar sands oil isn't cheap, so I don't know what to do with that. Now, what, what does this all mean in, in general? Well, it's I don't know what to make of it. It's very strange. Uh, all of these free market externalities, which had all these key resources like oil, natural gas, and, and metal go to other countries, was a part of the free market dogma since Ronald Reagan. This isn't the government's fault. The government was, was, prior to that, was doing protectionism. And the libertarians were like, well, protectionism was bad. Autarky is bad. That's going to ensure that we're not, we're not getting the best bang for our buck. It's like, well, what if China turns on us? What if Russia turns on us? Well, it doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. They're rational actors, don't you know? Well, okay. I agree with Black Horse that autarkic motivations are key in a lot of this. But that's, that's not libertarian in the slightest. They would say autarky was just fascism. I remember <laughs> I had arguments with them and I read their essays. So this gets to a, a more meta issue, right? Because we're all looking at data. We're all looking at information. The question is how how are we interpreting it or or what heuristic are we using to read it? And one of the problems I see here is that um, I'm not a libertarian and everybody knows why you can watch a number of my videos. I don't think there's any good reason to be one. If you're going to be one based off of the putative rationality and first principles position. Now, if you do believe that, then some of what Radlib says, uh, you would expect him to say, right? But then there's a lot you wouldn't like autarky. I don't, I don't see where you get that from, um, on, on, on a purely libertarian model. So I was actually going to say that libertarianism is what's framing this, but it's not because that's not all what a libertarian would say. Um, unless we're having a very different kind of libertarian now than the ones I remember. Now, for me, what I would say is all of this has to be contextualized within the fact that there's, we have, there's a very different understanding of the role government plays in all of this. Um, I, I think, you know, even though they're, sort of far, you know, sort of the left libertarians, Kevin Carson and C4SS talks about uh, the vulgar libertarians who just sort of look at existing corporations and assume they grew up in a free market vacuum. When in fact there was, you know, what he calls the mailed fist of the, huh, of the, of the, in the velvet glove of the free market. And so, and that would be, you know, these, these interests. Now he's, he's right. That's the actual account of how they were built. For those who've been watching my videos with Anthony Sutton and then Frederick C. Howe, I basically agree that there is this 
Wall Street elite, financial elite, that has been gradually taking power within the United States. It, it existed from the beginning. It was sort of beaten in 1837 for a time when Jackson defeated the National Bank, but it reasserted itself in secret in 1913. Having done so, its tendrils have extended all throughout society. And so it's this, uh, this is the, 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 the motive force to all of these large scale industrial firms. I mean, part, part of the reason why, you know, back in the day, I think it was the only, the only railroad they could point to that was not part of a public private partnership was the great Northern is because you really can't build railroads without a public private partnership. That's just where the money comes from. <laughs> but also, and this is a point that Kevin Carson has made too. A lot of this infrastructure would be too expensive to defend if you didn't have the government uh, collectivizing the defense by having the taxpayers pay for the police. And so they, they, the, the cost of protecting fixed capital is then offloaded onto us, the taxpayer. If that, didn't if that system didn't exist, which undergirds almost all modern economic development, um, yeah, we have a very different economic structure. We probably wouldn't have large refineries because it'd be difficult to capitalize. Um, and so the way I look at this is that these industries actually exist because of the government, not just in the sense that the government allows them to not have to pay for the protection of the property, but also helps get them started with initial funds. Uh, obviously, you know, the corruption of getting government officials to allow for certain bills to be passed, which are advantageous to certain industries. A, a classic point, a classic example of this would be at the end of World War II, after the railroads were blown out, being used to transport war materials and soldiers from coast to coast. Do you rebuild the railroads or do you build a highway? Well, that's going to determine whether you have a car culture or not, because while there were cars in America at the time, they weren't going to uh, be as dominant as they are now if we'd have instead reverted back to a railroad society. But it was, of course, the government that made that decision under Eisenhower and then built out the railroads. So the, the issue then here is we know this, right? <laughs> this, is, this is not a part of an organic, spontaneous American culture. This developed out of a set of conditions that the government, along with automobile industries and oil industries, working together to do this. And with the concession on autarky, then uh, this falls apart even further because you, you would have strong interests to do this at home, but these are national interests. But of course, national interests affect you and I because if your nation loses a war and gets conquered, we'll depend on who's doing the conquering. That could, that could affect you, you know, personally in a whole bunch of ways. All right, that's pretty much all I got. The um, let's go to the comments. Cyber Ninja Zero TBF autarky is very base, and these aren't the open border libertarians. Y yeah, but Hoppe was against autarky. That's the point. No libertarian was in favor of autarky when I was reading their stuff in 2000, 2005, 2010. That's the point. That 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 seems to me to be a complete repudiation of libertarian principles because that implies protectionism to protect the industries that you're building at home rather than comparative advantage. I mean, a good example of this libertarianism 101 was a series of lectures given by Walter Block called Radical Austrianism, I think. And he starts off talking about comparative advantage. GF. I mean, I'm not well read in any sort of economic theory, but it seems pretty clear to me that if you don't, something someone else will, and they may not be friendly to you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Cyber Ninja Zero. Todd's giving the meta metal pill based. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hashima Wan, flying cars back in the future. Yep. Cyber Ninja Zero, TBF, I don't think they're saying you can keep innovating indefinitely. I think that they view it as... We have a very large number of resources and absent war machinery. The civilian population can make do indefinitely. Okay, you know, uh, fair enough. Two points to be said. At the end of scarcity limit 
uh, scarcity delusion, Black Horse did say there's an absolute theoretical limit, presumably hundreds of years from now. But but this is just the point, absent the war machinery. But it's always been present. That that's that that's the problem. You know, the, this this explosion of American industrial development, a lot of these firms that that were then able to shelter under the uh, fiction of corporate personhood sort of got just started, you know, uh, supporting the union war effort. And then of course, as World War I and World War II continue to ramp this up, um, you, you, can't, you can't walk that back. Now, the other thing that I would say is the reason why these are two sides of the same coin, you can't separate them, is because in order to have the free flow of goods and a universal trade zone for the whole world, you you need to have a you need to have a global policeman. That's even what Mises said in his 1927 uh, liberalism. He said you need to have a one world government to ensure free trade, because other nations might just close their borders. And of course, the United States Navy from 1945 until now has represented that credible threat that would allow for the universal transport of these goods. Because if it's not there, as we're even if it is there, as we're seeing with the Houthis, people will find ways to attack it. Um, I just, I just, I don't think, yeah, that's probably the most charitable way of putting their point, but I just don't see that as something you can untangle. Those two are very intimately connected. Uh, let's see what else we got? got a lot of comments. That's great. Frederick 1483, I would argue that it's even more of a regulatory problem. I mean, a lot of these, quote, regulations, the quote, the green regulations that people would point to, Russia and China don't have. And yet they're still fighting for these resources. Well, sounds like they know that they need them and they're going to be harder to get. Oh, no. Cyber Ninja Zero said the vid is muted. Well... I don't know how that happened. I had the, the sound going. I guess we'll just have to put that in the link later. Crim uh, M3T4PHYZ at criminally underrated channel. Thank you. Uh... Frederick 1483, I mean, Oklahoma has more oil under than the whole of the Middle East. We just don't want people to drill new wells there. The only reason fracking really became a thing is to get around that. Well, again, that's nimbyism. But that's not the government. I mean, an authoritarian government would just say, you know, <laughs> like in China, just 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 live in a toxic waste dump where we get rid of all of our stuff. It's, it's the nimbies that, that don't want you to do that. And that's a lot of different people, both on the left and the right. Okay, so when people say it was muted, that's I, I didn't mute it. You just didn't hear the video, and I don't know why. That's kind of unfortunate. But uh, let's see. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I'll just I'll just have that video posted afterwards as a comment so everybody can watch it. But the basic point I was getting at with Eroy is that if you if you just run an energy loop, <laughs> you're not really going to get anywhere after a certain point. Mona, have not read on Autarchy in a long time. We'll have to, as guys say, return. Well, I mean, that's why Autarchy as a principle exists. I mean, if you assume you're going to compete with other people, that competition includes war, then yeah, you better. Uh, unless you have some, some work around. So I would say, in conclusion, wrapping this all up, a lot of, a lot of uh, people in the audience say that was great. I kind of don't know what to make of this. A lot of this doesn't sound very libertarian at all. Um, and those are the parts I agree with. So that's kind of interesting. But the other point is, this isn't about technical limitations. Well, it kind of is. But it, it's not even about government regulation or prices of goods. It's about energy. It's thermodynamics. Unless you can have an you know infinite motion machine, perpetual motion machine, you're not going to solve this. It's the same pro it's a, it, it's a similar problem now 
How long can we kick the can down the road is anyone's guess. But the fact that we can keep, but again, let's go back to the, let's go back to the hedonist liberal that wants to just be a complete sex freak. You know, eventually you're going to have to pay the piper. You know, society bends to protect you from those consequences, but you will have to pay one day. And I know that Red Lib and Black Horse would believe that. And I also, but this is the same thing, energy consumption. We are building a system which shelters you and gives you as much energy as it can to consume. But with the same reasoning, there will be a limit. The, the problem is a lot of these people have been overly sensational and, and picked limits, dates that were too early. That doesn't discredit the process. Um, it just means you need to be more careful about when you're going to say this is going to happen because the fundamental mechanism is not addressed. And that's, that's fundamentally what changed my mind. When I, when I actually read the, the arguments uh, and didn't hear a recapitulation by, you know, whether they're libertarians or Wall Street financiers or, or tech bros of this problem, I'm like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, there's no way to get around thermodynamics. Interesting. Now, if Black Horse or Radley would like to discuss this in the future, I'd be happy to discuss that with them as well. And thank you, everyone. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast signing off.